Welcome back to Seen It Before, where we're probably going to say something stupid about your favorite movie because we've seen it all before. I'm Danny. I'm Dan, and uh, I had nothing stupid to say to you today. You have That's good, because you you you're very mean. <laughs> Every time, it hurts my feelings, genuinely. This isn't even an act. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, it's totally an act. You don't care. <laughs> no, you don't. you like it when I do that. No. You like it. That's not, no. Masochism. No. no. <laughs> that is not, No. Anyway, we have a special guest today. Uh, it's James in the control room. Yep, Hello, he how's was, it going? He is directing for his second time for us now. He was our director on the Doctor Strange review. And he's going to be on another episode coming up soon, or a few episodes, should I say, coming up soon. Yep. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that in another time. It'll be a surprise. Big surprise, yeah. yeah. Anyway, That's, so... There's your hint. Yeah, so James, what are we watching today? Uh, today, we watched The Truman Show. Which yeah, which happens like, to be your favorite movie, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like, it, it's definitely top five. But like I've considered it top one. Well, yeah, he d- yeah, he definitely did. He, I think you actually showed me this movie in college. I don't know if I ever saw it before that, but we definitely watched it in college. Oh yeah, I know yeah. we definitely watched it. I don't know if you're the one that introduced me to it though. So yeah. it is what it is. Um, this is the first time that I've actually seen this movie, <clears throat> so that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, true, true, true. And show. <laughs> yeah, and it's also um. It's also James's birthday in the next coming days, huh? It hey. is very soon. We're approaching it. And that, that was no five. coincidence. I guess. It's sort of a coincidence. It's sort of not a coincidence. I don't know. I guess we planned this around <laughs> your birthday. <laughs> um, but yes. So let's uh let's start off with this movie, huh? So Truman Show stars Jim Carrey um, as Truman uh, Burbank. Burbank, yeah. Burbank. Truman Burbank. Yeah, Burbank, California. It's actually uh, where a lot of Hollywood stars and actors live. Yeah. Yeah. We also get Laura Linney, you know. Before. Before, before her uh, Wendy Bird days. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. That, that's where I know her from, <laughs> yeah. from, from yeah. Ozark. Me too. So, yeah. oh. She did a really good job in this movie. I think, you know, like, she played, like, not psychotic, but, like, uh, she. She gave me flashes of like, Wendy Bird there, like yeah, manipulation like, and everything. Yeah, like, oh. like uneasy, kind of <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, we got to make sure Truman doesn't, you know, pop a gasket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Very, like, 50s housewife-esque. Um, yeah, yeah the outfits very too. much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling, so like, I, maybe, like, subliminally, like, this whole movie was, like, based off the 50s, so, like, it was, like, kind of like Kristoff's childhood, I'm guessing that might have been, he, he based it off yeah. of that. Yeah. This was a really kind of like suburban utopia or suburbia. Perfect so. island, perfect community type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Like no that's, crime, that's the whole no, yeah, thing. That's yeah. the whole gimmick. Yeah. Like he says in the movie, what society should be. It's, yeah. This was his idea of what it should be. The first thing, I guess we'll start with, um, you know, the beginning. It's just, does the beginning kind of start off with like him as a kid or is that like a flashback a little? No, that's a flashback. It yeah, starts flashback. off right when he like, go, he leaves the house and, and like he talks to the to the family right, right. across the, the street. The very first starts off with him in the mirror talking to himself that's as right. a pep talk in the morning. That's oh, right. yeah. Yeah, that's so, the very first shot. Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm if I'm Truman, though, like the number one thing on my mind this entire movie was just like how many embarrassing moments were broadcast to millions of people. Yep. Like, yep. <laughs> like he seems pretty natural in his like normal state, but like I do weird shit when I'm alone, you know? I fucking like look in the mirror and I'll like, make funny faces and shit. Like, I don't want. I don't want to be shown to people. You got your little your food dance that you do. Well, no, I'm I'm pa- I'm proud of that. That's yeah. that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> also, another thing I noticed is that like <laughs> he's very he's not very albino for a guy that's never actually seen the outside. Yeah, uh, James, you said they mentioned that in the movie. I must have missed that. Uh, I didn't see so it. they didn't mention it, but it's like an Easter egg in one of the frames. There is shown early on in the movie a jar of whatever you want to call it, of vitamin D supplements, like high-dose oh. vitamin D supplements that he takes daily um, as a way to combat not being exposed to the sun, so he gets that vitamin D hmm. he needs, which you get from the sun. Yeah, that's shown in a scene early on in the movie, but, like, they don't reference it. Oh, I guess that makes sense, yeah. And, like, I also had, maybe they subliminally show it, like, there must have been, like, a quick shot or something. Um, but they show uh, regular, like, POVs of of people, especially like the scene where like uh, Truman's going after um, her name's Meryl, yeah. um, his wife. Yeah. Um, kind of like they're going back and forth having an argument, it, but it shows their point of view, their perspective. So is there like little cameras and like their their but- button cameras? Yeah. Oh, button cameras. Yes. I thought it was like 
I thought it was like in the, like a like a contact lens or something like that, like they did in the Batman. Nope, button cameras. Button yeah, cameras. Yeah, they mentioned that at least once that I can remember. Yeah, they they say it's button cameras. Yeah, right, right here. And they have like what fifteen thousand? They said fifteen thousand um, cameras. Or five thousand. Five thousand. It was over five thousand. Well, crazy. that's a lot of cameras. It's a lot of cameras. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of switchers. That's a lot of switcher sources you got going on. A lot of yeah. ND banks. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can just imagine when they like imagine trying to do like. Like a um a picture in picture because we know how like the boards work. Yeah, you have you have two Emmys, and so you have one, and then you have to have the other. What if it's like a camera that's all the way like across the room? And you have to hit the buttons. You know you have to you know you know what I mean. But it's yeah, it'd be really difficult to, you know, maneuver. I'd have to imagine getting real technical with it that they have people devoted to just routing certain cameras into a single set of sources, so that way they're only choosing from like. A certain amount at a time. Mm-hmm. It's like they That's have if their you want own. To get super technical with it. They have <laughs> like designated like ingest yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> department. <laughs> yeah, just follow him and route the cameras to the right sources. Yeah. That's all you do. <laughs> so this this movie kind of like opens up with um, uh, Ed Harris, Kristoff talking about um, you know we get tired of actors and like we want reality. And I'm thinking like this is like the most reality TV that a reality TV can ever get. Um, and like reality TV itself is not even, it's not even real because yeah, what they do is that like, they just record bulks of for days, maybe even weeks of footage. And then they just, uh, they write a script based off of that footage. Then they edit it together. So it's not even, so it's like, it's somewhat real, but like, you know, they'll, they'll spice in like, like a reaction shot. That's like not, not real. Like, like they didn't catch that in real time, you know? So yeah, 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 exactly. It's uh, breaking the fourth wall. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it, it literally we're just crushing people's dreams right now with reality television. Yeah, well, I mean, it's reality TV. Who gives a shit? I mean, the, maybe the most. Do. Some people do. Maybe the most reality TV shows are like are like competition shows. <laughs> Survivor. Yeah. You know, well, not maybe not even Survivor though. I wasn't. Thinking, I was thinking more like Top I've been wa- Chef. Top Chef, like <laughs> the, the, the cooking ones, because that's like it's lighthearted and like. You know, like in, if there's ever like drama, there's always like something goes wrong with the dish and like, oh, I cut my finger or some shit like that. So it's yeah. like, but that that could be real. So, you know. yeah, true, true. Uh, this, the scene where um, Truman loses his dad in the the water, it gave real Titanic vibes. It's like, oh yeah, don't Jack. Let me go. <laughs> let me go, Jack. <laughs> so I'm confused on what team is the father working for? Because later on we find out he's, a, he's like kind of wandering around as a homeless man. Yeah. Like, and then I'm thinking and when I first saw that, I'm thinking like, why would, why would the producers let it, him yeah. come back? And, and then apparently he broke in. Yeah. It wasn't towards scripted. The end. Yeah. But why would they re why would, so they rehire him um, to, to, the, you know, kind of get Truman out of his ex- existential crisis. Yeah. Why would he agree to that? Money. I don't know. Maybe, but I like, think it was more the fact that he was always more of a disgruntled employee more than he was a Truman advocate. Cause he just was unhappy. The fact that he got written off the show when he had such a main part being the dad. So I think it was more disgruntled employee broke on and there's like, Hey, we'll bring you back. We'll give you more money. He's like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. And then again, the other, I guess, disgruntled employee was Sylvia and she, well, she got she's she's kind off. of Truman's only ally in the entire movie that we that yeah. we really see, and yeah. she's she's not even really able to help him that much. Yeah, and then there's like you know the love triangles got going on with Meryl and uh, Sylvia slash what was her Lauren name? Laura yeah yeah Lauren slash Sylvia whatever, um, and she takes him away to the beach where oh, no other cameras are, and <laughs> big dick energy Truman's like. I'll take you away from all this. <laughs> he just straight up kisses him. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but like, you know, it's 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 nice to see like, you know, I would I had I had like the uh, like you know, the question of like what happens? Like, are there is there anybody who like genuinely wants to like free him? Does this is this happen a lot? Um and apparently they, they do bring it up. There's not many people that wanna like free Truman other than Sylvia, but um some people want to break in for fame, some people wanna break in to just <laughs> just to just to be on the show, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It like it's it's weird because like you know, there's she's the only one that helps him out, and it's like this kind of sucks. And like 
I'm confused in where what, if the audience is morally justified or like if what where they are because they're happy when he when he escapes. Like spoiler alert, it's for a 25 year old movie. He escapes, he gets out. <laughs> um, but the audience is is happy about that. But then they're they're witnessing this entire thing happen. And it's, they're not exactly rooting for him to escape from the beginning. So it's like, I'm not sure if like where they are, like if, should I like them or not? You know, I, uh, I liked the social commentary about the audience personally. Um, the whole movie itself sent, seemed to me to be like a, like perversion of reality stars, you know, taking advantage of these people unwillingly to exploit them for, you know, art or fame or whatever you'd like to call it in this instance. And the audience is just mindlessly going along with it at home. And I think it's a pretty nice parallel with how just a lot of media and stuff has shifted the last recent 20 years. I mean, this came out 25 years ago, so even before then. But, um, yeah, just commenting on the fact that we're mindlessly indulging this uh, exploitation. Mindlessly following orders and everything. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, because I like, like what's the, what's like the metaphor that they're trying to say? Because like I remember, I mean, I forgot to write it down. I think, but um, well, I know the big overarching metaphor in this is religious connotations, like Christianity, especially based religious connotations. Oh, um, how so? I don't. I didn't catch well, that. Christoph, Christ. He is God, the creator of yep. this universe, and Truman is his creation. Yep. That is the child he overlooks. Um, something referenced in the movie a lot, um, subliminally, not actually spoken, but is uh, the numbers 139. Um, that's on a boat early on in the movie. And also the day that he escapes is day 10,913, which changed the numbers. You get 139. Um, that relates to Psalm 139, which is a book in which the main character from it, uh, the speaker, um, questions God and uh, realizes and recognizes God's omnip- omnipotence. Uh, and yeah, huh. so it relates to discovering God and his overall power and potential abuse of power as a creator. Huh. Yeah, so a lot of Christian uh, based. Yeah, that, that just this. flew right over my head. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't even think about that. But like, but now that you say it, oh, it makes sense because it's like, like um, I I took it more of a metaphor for like um, I guess actors, um, like how I guess sometimes they feel trapped in a role, like maybe for like TV, like typecasting TV roles, like Brian Cranston probably can't really escape Walter White too often, and like um, Robert Downey Jr. is always going to be known as Iron Man now. Tom Holland's always going to be known as Spider Man. Yeah, and it's like, is this is it a, is it um a metaphor for like the paparazzi where like you're, you're like, once you're famous, you can never leave the spotlight. Something's always on you or something like that. Like Jim Carrey did cite the paparazzi as a large uh, influence in his acting. Mm. Yeah, He used that a lot to figure out how it would be like to be constantly watched. And yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit, I mean, it would be, it's, I think it's, it obviously it's incredibly cruel to do this to somebody to like, not, you know, to like, unknowingly if like they don't sign up for it you know and like i think that's just like not the worst thing to do but one of the worst things to do to somebody if like, your entire life is a lie you know yeah. <laughs> it, it, it sucks <laughs> yeah and then so when the big scene is when you know truman escapes with meryl in the car and everything and they're driving and everything and they're just trying to stop him at every possible turn you know the traffic jam then the forest fire, <laughs> then yeah. the, um, the nuclear, the, the power, nuclear plant. power plant leak. Yeah. And eventually he's just like, it, he gets calmed down by these subliminal messages like on the TV and everything. And it's just like all the product placement. And it's just like, what is this? <laughs> oh, I remember what the metaphor is. Yeah. Uh, um, midlife crisis. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's like Truman at kind of in, it's not, he's not the middle of his life, but, um, you know, he's like 32, 35 in this movie, right? Uh, he's 30, 30, like okay. turning 30 in this movie. So, yeah. So that's like, you know, close to the, you know, where like, where you start to just imagine like, what is my life? What am I doing? 
you know, should I be doing more? You know, because he wants to travel to Fiji. He wants to he wants to experience the world. And even since he was a little kid, he's like, I wanted to be a, um, an explorer like Magellan. Yes. And so he's finally kind of realizing I haven't done anything with my life. I've just kind of lived it and has you know done my thing. And you know, in, to Christoph's point, like you know, sure he's safe and like he doesn't have to experience any of the hardships of the real world or whatever. Like that's what you know he wants. It's, he's like a protective mother. He wants to lock him in a padded cell, you know, and, uh, you know, away from all the, all the dangers of the world. But like, I, I'm not a parent, but I heard a lot about a lot of parenting advice is you got to let your kids fail sometimes. And Christoph's not letting Truman do that. So, nope. Yeah. He's keeping him in a soft padded cell. Yeah. For like ever. It's like, that's, <laughs> that's not great parenting. Yeah. I wonder if Christoph has kids. He, I don't I, think he does. I, I think Truman's his kid. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. I want to say, I think this job takes a bit much of his free time. Yeah. I don't think he has time for that sort of stuff. Yeah, he's probably there like 14, 16 hours a day at least, and then like eight hours Truman sleeping. He's like asleep. I wouldn't be surprised if he sleeps in that moon base that they have set up. Sleeping in the moon base. eleventh floor or whatever. <laughs> well, there is one scene where like, you know, in the middle of the night, like when they, when Christoph notices uh, that Truman escaped, um, he comes in in his pajamas. Yeah. You know, he's holding a cup of coffee. But also, that makes me think, what do the actors, specifically Meryl and I forgot the guy's name, his Marlin. best friend, Marlon, what do they get out of being actors in Truman's life? Specific, like, more, I mean, Marlon could, like, because, like, Marlon can I understand he doesn't have to spend every, you know, every moment with Truman. But, like, uh, Meryl has to spend every night with Truman, in like, in bed. Yep. But like, while... But while she's at work, I think is when she gets to do whatever. That's she when wants. she gets like free time, Probably. you know. Okay. Yeah, that's what I would guess. But like, it's not. She doesn't get too much a of a life commitment. though. <laughs> yeah, like it ha she had to be getting paid a lot of money. But she can't, like, does she have a house outside of this thing? She does. She probably has to stay close to the set, you know. Like yeah. so, like it's not. It's, I don't think she would have too much of a life outside of the Truman Show. You know, unless she's just sadistic and just wants to do this to somebody <laughs> for could, fun. That could be the same said for Kristoff and everyone that's involved with the show. They probably don't have much of a life. Yeah, well, it's Chris also worth noting, she was the first one of the actors to really break, like completely break down, say, I can't handle this. It's unprofessional. Like, what is going on? And likely because she was the one that su was subject subjected to the worst of it all, having to constantly be there and literally be the support for the main character so. yeah like she's not, she's not she's just as much wound up in this thing as, as truman is only she it's worse because she knows what's going on yeah yeah so it's it's you know it's sad you know but also i hadn't i had like a theory or like maybe i'm not sure if this happened it might have happened in truman's life but um the way you know how lauren looked at him across the field and um, Truman's like trying to trying to check it out. So like uh, Truman's Truman's picking her, and like I wonder if like other actresses like had had that moment in the in the movie, and they're just like and then and then Meryl c comes up and like kind of steals Truman's attention. She, and like you know I was thinking like you know she could have had a career, you know like the, the you know, yeah. Lauren Lauren could have had a career as Truman's wife, you know. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. just, but she lost out big due to Meryl. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just thought about that. Yeah. I, I, I don't know where you're going with that, man. But, like, it's it, it's a good thought. And, like, another good thought is, like, you know, we can just say, like, is are, are we living in a simulation? Yeah, that's always the question. That's always the question know? with this. Like, it makes me, I, I mean, I've, I've, like, I've had thoughts of, like, um, I'm the only sentient person. Everyone else around me is a projection mm -hmm. of like of like my subconscious or something like that. Yep. Um, I've had I've had things where like um, you know, where I'm just alone and I'm thinking like, does Sep know what I'm thinking right now, <laughs> or something like that? Like, does do, do people do my parents? Do you is guys know what I'm thinking? She Meryl. <laughs> <laughs> Since uh, this movie came out, there's actually been reported cases of like specifically, I think schizophrenic patients that have believed their life is like this and they like have psychotic breaks or whatever. Um, and I think there is even a medical name for it based off the movie. Although that I'm not at all positive on. 
But yeah, there's like, been reported cases where people believe their life is like a TV show, like this movie. So yeah, this movie kind of, but in like, a way, harmed people. I don't want to blame the movie though. Yeah, and like obviously brings into question, you know, the Sims video game as well. Like when we're controlling <laughs> them, are we controlling real things? And then the, yeah, their universe. A, like, are we playing God with them? Are we their God? Like that was like. <laughs> um, do you remember the movie uh, Gamer? No, I never. It was saw like it. 2008 or something with Gerard Butler, where like he's he's in like this. Um, he's in a video game, and he is uh, a warrior. Like he's he's in the middle of war. It's like kind of like Call of Duty, and he his body gets taken over by a teenager playing the video game, um, you know, and he, you know he's putting his life on the line. It's like kind of like battle royale where you you die, you die, you know. So it's like it's he's he's like living a real life, and then um, you know he's in he's in danger of being killed and stuff. And the whole movie is about him breaking free of that. He kills Michael C. Hall, I think he's the villain, you know, Dexter. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is that same sort of thing. Like it, he's being controlled by a god, you know, where like he's not in control of his actions. So, yeah, that's that's, that's fucked. Yeah, I mean, another <laughs> movie is the the Matrix, obviously. Yeah, like living in the simulation, literally. Free guy you know, is another free guy of that too. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So like, there's it, th this movie kind of. Um, I don't want to say it's not. It's not the it's not the ba the template for for all these types of movies, but it kind of started the idea of like different you know, living in simulations. Your life isn't real; it's fake. You know, you need to wake up. That kind of thing. One big point of the movie that I think was really trying to push that I loved and I think is very helpful in a way is your condition to just blindly accept what is going on around you, and you need to be wary of that. You need to make sure you're aware of where your life is, what's going on, like what is happening, you know, never just accept things at face value. I think it was a big message this movie was trying to push. Like always be aware of what's going on. Yeah, yeah like, well, like like critical thinking, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, just, you know, never take something as face value. Like it might not always be as it seems. Like, yeah. Yeah, well, there's because like there are going to be people that want to manipulate you in your life. That's just probably just going to be a fact. They're going to try to get what they want over what you want. Yep. And, you know, Truman, unfortunately, just never learned the skills because he was manipulated so young. He just thought it was part of regular life. Yeah. He's just like, my life is just like this, you know? It's like, and, you know, he, he tr you know, he truly trusts Marlon. Like, Marlon throughout, through the most of the movie, up until like the last, like right when he, like, when he supposedly recovers from his psychotic break, um, you know, after that, you know, but before before that, Marlon's the most trusted person, and I want we don't really see Jim Carrey or Truman. Why did I say Jim Carrey? <laughs> we don't see Truman really go through like the emotional like like truly. We don't have like we don't have a scene with with Truman really being like everything I know is a lie. We kind of like kind of skip over that, and he he's like escaping. So that would have been a cool scene. You know, yeah, it, it kind of would have been. Unless bad. I missed it, James. I'm not sure if I missed it. No, no, it, there wasn't a major. Oh my God, what is this whole life been? Moment in the movie. There wasn't. Yeah, that explored deeply. And I'm not saying the movie needs it. This movie's good enough. You know, without that, I think it would just add add a little more to that. You know, an R-rated psychotic breaks. Like, oh my God, my life is a lie. Well, maybe like yeah. a Moon Knight kind of like scene, yeah. or like you know. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, there's another movie that came out actually a year after this in 1999, Ed TV. So that yes. was, yeah, basically the same type of thing except with a film crew following this man around for his whole life. Basically a real, real life story. Oh, you so know like what? Boyhood? Yeah, that reminded me of Boyhood. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Uh, like, I wonder how that kid feels. Is, well, I mean, he wasn't 24-7 filmed. Yeah. But he, you know, he would always, like, go into the doing this movie for 12 years. Um, you know, it was like watching him grow up. So that's probably the ethical way of doing something like what Christoph wanted to do. But I don't know. <laughs> ethical is a big question there. But well, you know this, this movie is not ethical no, not in any word, sense of the word. <laughs> no. Nah. Christoph is definitely a villain. Um, you know, even his justification is it, he's lying to himself when he says like, oh, if, if, if Truman really wanted to, you know, go out into the real world, I, we'd let him, you know. If, but if we don't want him. We, we don't want this passing ambition. Yeah. You know, but like. You fucking arrest him and like block him and 
from getting yeah. there's no way to get out it's you know? just a sick game that Kristoff is playing like yeah he says oh you can leave if you want yeah okay bullshit he yeah. can't he can't leave That's, unless yeah. he he's smart enough to outsmart god basically you can yeah, leave so. if you want, but we're also going to turn the wind up to damn 11 to make sure you don't. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're going to attempt to kill you. <laughs> if, yep. if you. If you get out of it, we'll let you go. But then even like right at the last second, Kristoff is still <laughs> trying to convince him like, like, you know, like you don't want to go out in the real world. You want to come back here where it's safe. And, you know, I, I think he's he's definitely more motivated. He's, he's not motivated by like, um, he, yeah, he's not, yeah, he's not motivated by, um, keeping or truly trying to protect Truman, he's he's motivated by his either his own selfish interest, um, monetary reasons, um, because he has the highest rated show in the world, twenty four seven. Imagine having like millions of viewers hold on for twenty four hours, yeah. like nonstop. Like, that'd be crazy. cool. Crazy, crazy amounts of money, and it's, and no commercial breaks either. All the product placement is there. Coco, right here. Yeah, yeah right so, on the mountains of Mount Nicaragua. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I wanted to highlight um, uh, Laura Laura Linney. Is that yeah, her name? Laura, Laura Linney. Linney. Yeah. She she sold those um, those those product placements really well. Oh yeah, yeah. Where she's <laughs> like, you know, like you should get a, a, a flex blade or whatever they call it, the lawnmower. Oh she yeah, gives, I, she gives a little wink. I loved that one scene. There was the elk rotary. Um, the elk rotary. Like, oh, like, you should get an elk rotary instead of, you know, fixing up this old mower. He's like, Truman's like, no, I'm good. Um, and then later we see a shot of Marlin trying to use it because they had to get the product placement in there and Truman wasn't going to do it. So here he is, this guy that clearly doesn't know how to mow a lawn, really just <laughs> Struggle trying to mow this lawn <laughs> on his elk rotary. Go into town. <laughs> yeah. And then to go along with all the product placement, the they had some pretty inventive camera angles in this movie. Like just the you know, the button cams and everything, all these POV shots that were really well done. I yeah, it's ring it's pretty inventive. Yeah, the pretty inventive stuff. I like the garbage can camera. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just hanging out, just the guys hold the cam. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, he's just like, what are you doing? Yeah, he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, the most inventive camera, I think, was um I mentioned right at the beginning of the movie, uh Truman's ring is uh that's a camera. Yep. You know? And like i we don't we don't ever see a view of it, I don't think, but um, um so actually fun fact, uh a lot of people think that's his wedding band. It's not. It is a ring that is given to him by his father when he drowns early. Uh oh when we see that scene, you can see the like ring slip off his finger. Oh um, yeah, that's when Truman gets it. Oh well, that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Now that yeah, some dark shit. Why would <laughs> I'm just like people have to, people in this movie just have to not have a conscience. It's like okay, let's traumatize this little boy with his father dying, <laughs> and like because that goes against Kristoff's main message, where like uh, you know, like um, got to move the story forward though, Danny. I mean, yeah, but like you want to keep Truman safe, you don't fucking drown his father. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it was a big old, where do you draw the line when trying to create art? Because I think it was trying to drive home that Kristoff was a very artsy kind of person, very into the craft of storytelling and creation and trying to revolutionize that. And it's like, where do you draw the line? When is enough enough? Like, very clearly, we crossed that line very early on when he adopted a baby and shoved a camera on its face twenty four seven. So, <laughs> the morals well, were out the window. Well, yeah, I mean, we see we see Kristoff in his element when he's um, re when he's doing the directing the one scene. Um, I forgot what it was, but oh, it was it was the uh, oh the reunited with his father. Yeah. Yeah, like we see him like, like oh and music and you know uh, no don't go to the wide yet crane, crane or, camera yeah 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 it's like they have they have he has the whole setup he's like very invested in the whole thing so yeah. you know he's like he's good at what he does I guess uh, yeah very good fun fact with that scene the person playing piano in there was actually one of the people who created original music for the film including that piece that he's playing at that moment hmm. was created by the guy on piano there oh hmm. yeah yeah. It actually made me wonder how, like, they gloss over it, but, like, how did they get audio to Truman uh, when he's on the boat? Um, how Were they playing music uh, over the broadcast? Because the music cuts out um, when the broadcast is turned off for the, for the last time. I think the music is only going for the broadcast. 
Yeah, but, but like, he Truman couldn't hear it, obviously. But it was just okay. the, it was just the broadcast. So is is it? I'm saying is it like diegetic music where like we're hearing it, but it's also happening on the in in the movie on I, the broadcast. Or I like, think the music we're hearing, all of it, happens in the broadcast sent out over TV, but it is not heard throughout Sea Haven Island. Um, so like it's such a weird thing where it is both diegetic and non diegetic <laughs> at the same time. Because it's not in Truman's world, but it is in the TV world, which is not, yeah. Yeah, and I know what you mean, though. She's not, yeah. <laughs> I always found the surgery scene pretty funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so he, you know, he's talking to this nurse or whatever, tr- pretends to walk away, then follows her to the the operating room <laughs> where Laura Linney's just standing there, just like, scalpel. <laughs> so like, the uh, guy's scalpel, going, I guess. Uh, <laughs> gonna cut the person. Yeah, they're gonna. Like, yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> like, imagine that actually having to happen. Yeah, like this. <laughs> like the guys just like don't cut my leg open. Like I would have at least like maybe given them fake prop uh, <laughs> scalpels or something. Like that. But, yeah. And like, but it's funny because like the actors have no, they have no idea what to do when when Truman starts going off off his predicted route. And like you guys should have seen this coming. I mean, like. <laughs> People can be unpredictable, you know. So it's like when, when if you just want to do something spontaneous, like go get ice cream or something like that. Yeah. When well, like when you're going home from work, like you got to be prepared, right? That's like the whole point. Well, for thirty years, I think it was the idea that they've never needed these contingencies before. He has been a predictable person, so you know they might not take it as seriously when they prepare or plan or think out of these contingencies because they clearly did have contingencies in place like the nuclear power plant was already on the outskirts of town and clearly Truman never heads out that way normally so it was I think clear that that was a built-in contingency plan to just oh shit he's leaving let's start the nuclear meltdown type thing so he doesn't leave um I think it was just an instance of they all got cocky thinking this hasn't happened for 29 years why is it going to start happening now and they weren't prepared for it true but like, if I'm Truman, like thirty years, like thirty years of not not leaving Sea Haven, like you know how like no he he left he went to Mount Rushmore remember, <laughs> like they drug the kid or something like that. Oh, yeah, so you slept the they, whole the whole car yeah, ride, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like you know if if like if I'm yeah I'm like twenty three right now. If I want to go if I want to go to like just to Connecticut or something, like I'm. Like if, well, okay, I'm saying like the amount of times that like I would want to go somewhere and to have that sponta- spontaneously not be able to happen, I would, I would keep note of that. Like if it's like, I can't leave Sea Haven, I would have noticed way before 30 years, I think. They also conditioned him from a very early yeah. age to never want to leave Sea Haven. You know, there's mentions, there's a sign when he goes to leave, it says like, you are now leaving Sea Haven. Why would you ever want to leave? The or something like that. Yeah, the there's a lot messaging. of just... Um, in fact, there's one newspaper in the background. The newspapers say a lot, but as he's first starting talking about leaving, the newspaper says, who needs Europe right on the headlines is in like, why would you need to go anywhere else? Everywhere else sucks. This is good. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the, the, plane the plane with the lightnings, with, like it yep. could yes. happen to you. Yeah. yeah. And there was also like, um, insurance, you need travel insurance. You could be victim of terrorists, storms, gang attacks. It even said, yeah. yeah. All that subliminal messaging, man. Right, it's, but uh, at the same time, though, like, okay, so, like, um, bear with me here. Oh, God. <laughs> Young Christian girls are conditioned to think sex is bad. Okay. But there's that rumor and that, like, that kind of stereotype that, like, they break out and rebel mm-hmm. once they come of age, right? Mm-hmm. So why wouldn't Truman have, like, a phase like that if he's conditioned for so long? I think that would almost be natural. Well, we saw a lot from Merrill and then his mother as well that not only were they conditioning him, they would dismiss any thoughts that he did have. They would immediately change the subject, ignore it, give reasons why he shouldn't be leaving, and then just move right on past. He never got the chance to actually explore his desire to travel and go places. And not only that, they conditioned him early on to be afraid of water. The yep. entire island is on a bridge, or uh, the sorry, the entire place is an island yeah, yeah, yeah. surrounded by bridges, and they establish later on he has a extreme fear of even driving over water. Like that's how deeply ingrained this trauma is into him. Oh, uh, okay, so maybe that's why they wanted to kill the father. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that makes, that makes more to sense. to make him never want to go in the water, near water, around water whatsoever. Speaking to of, completely traumatize him. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, um, when he breaks out to sail at the end, Neil breaks out of the house and goes sailing. How the fuck does he remember how to sail? That was like, what, twenty at least 20 years ago? Like, and how often did he actually go sailing? Yeah, no, it's I like, don't. I don't. It, it's a little contrived at, at that point. But like, yeah, I. It, 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 you gotta, I, you gotta go suspend with Suspend belief there. Yeah. But like, it's, I will say, I'm, I took sailing for one week in Boy Scouts when I was 11. I still could get the gist of it done. It's so is it, is it kind of like riding a bike where you just never forget? Kind of. I mean, if you're like devoted to it enough, especially at a young age, you learn stuff easier and retain it. Yeah, but more. how often did he actually go out in the water with his dad or something? I mean, like, we saw him out on the water with his dad and they weren't, you know, having any issues out on the water. It's clear they knew what they were doing and he was... Young at the time. I think it's definitely plausible. They took him out sailing frequently. All yeah. Right. All right. That's fair. We we can go with it. We'll go with it. <laughs> Ed Harris has a knack for showing up in movies where, like, um, there's a big lie in somebody's life, in the main character's life. Yeah. I'm thinking of Snowpiercer. Yeah. Where, like, <laughs> it is like, yeah, this entire thing, we just, like, manufacture this, like, you know, this, uh, you know, haves and have nots. You know, because I forgot what the whole me real message was, but it's like where like he like um, he hired somebody in the in the back of the train to be to like to ha convince other people to be like the lower class, so like there there can be an upper class and a class dynamic to for humanity su to survive or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's also he's going to offer Chris Evans the opportunity to do that. You know, but so it's a little different here, but like, you know, he's like, there's still like everything, you know, the character knows is a lie, you know, and he's like, he's the proprietor of that. So yeah, <laughs> it's a very niche thing that Ed Harris has going on. Fair <laughs> point. Um, Jim Carrey and uh, Ed Harris never met at all during the filming of this, makes which makes sense. Makes they were sense. never in a scene together, not physically anyway. Um, yeah, they never met each other. Hmm. Um, a question that I did have from this movie, though, that still bugs me and was never answered. How did the child actors work? Cause it's a lot harder to tell a child actor, you know, this person does not know what's going on. You can't, you know, break character ever, that sort of stuff. And clearly he had to be a child at some point, go to school. He even said that he cheated off tests from, uh, or Marlon cheated off of his tests, meaning they went to school. There had to be kids around, but they never address how they were able to get these actors to yeah. not break the secret. Yeah, I mean, well, and plus, like, I'm not sure if this is some sort of dystopian world, but there are child labor laws. Yeah. You know, where you can't act for long, longer than eight hours it's for like, a child, it's, it's six hours. Six hours. I think it's I think. four for, like, children and stuff. Like it, four yeah. continuous hours without a break. At yeah. Least. Like, yeah. So that break is a lot longer than any guaranteed for adults and stuff. So a school day, that's longer than four hours. So like that's already I mean it's a plot hole but you know and also I was thinking like um it wouldn't be that interesting to watch Truman grow up until he's like age 4 or 5 you know so watching a baby grow up just get, you know yeah, getting fed food and stuff yeah, but like, people people pay money for that like people people will watch that like it's just I don't know any like of those that people. old that old elderly lesbian couple that was on the couch it seems like they'd watch that I guess you're right. Yeah. One of the top shows on Netflix right now is that Japanese show about babies, or not babies, but toddlers performing adult <laughs> tasks. Yeah, but I mean, that's yeah, it's interesting. It's a little different, though. but like, it is just watching children do stuff. Just like funny videos before YouTube. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. I guess you got me with cat videos. I love cat videos. <laughs> but also, um, this is kind of a side note. Um, is that like one of the first like lesbian couples depicted in film? Other than, because like, or is it like it's really implied? Because I know like um, Thelma and Louise is implied to be lesbian relationship. I don't know. I'm just curious. I don't know. It didn't seem very obvious, but like that's what I would assume it is. Yeah. Like who've, who's always together, falling asleep on the couch together. It seems like they live together. So like a kind of, they're either sisters or lesbians. So like, yeah, <laughs> it's, one the, it's one or the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just, you know, well, actually, cult, culture nowadays. That so. makes me think though, like, um, Every audience member that we see, like at the cafe, at the the, the couple on the on the on the couch, Weird the guy in the, the bathtub, tub. <laughs> which is why is he in a bathtub? But um, the whole they, time too, they never move. Yeah, they, that's the thing. They they they're always dressed the same. They never move. And this takes place over at least what a week, two four weeks, days. four days. Okay, yeah. still. 
So four days, you're still chilling in your pajamas on the couch. Like, something's up, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a little weird. Are you guys okay? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> but again, people have no life, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, maybe, like I said, maybe we're in a, in a dystopian universe where child labor laws don't exist and people don't get off their couch. Suspend belief, my guy. Suspend <laughs> belief. Yeah. Uh, you got anything else? Uh, I just like how it, it's, it's really cool when um, uh, Truman finally escapes. It's the first time he's actually taking agency in his life. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I said, it would have been, it would have added more if, like, we actually showed showed a moment of him being, like, resolved where he's just like, you know, it's a big, because that's a big moment, you, theoretically, where it's like, mm-hmm. it's the first time he's actually making a decision on his own without any influence and in that, in that he knows that there's no influence, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I thought it was really cool, but, um, and I liked how like it was kind of a surprise. Um, you know, <laughs> I liked when it, um, Marlin comes out of the, out of the hole. Um, he's just like, he's, he's gone, you know, <laughs> cut, cut the transmission. <laughs> yeah. And like to think that's also a big moment. Cause that's the first time the transmissions ever stopped mm-hmm. Yep, ever in ever. almost 30 years. Yeah. I have a lot of references to some of the subtle details that they yeah. put in this movie. Um, let's see. Uh, so the music that he listens to in his radio on the way to work is classical music, which might be an odd choice for someone to listen to daily, but the reasoning for it, it's copyright free. There's yeah. no worry about copyrights for the broadcast, uh, over television. Yeah. So they can use it without any issues whatsoever. Oh so. my God. God, I just realized Truman hasn't experienced pop culture. No. Ever. He can't. Nope. Oh, man, his mind's going to be blown when he sees Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's uh, also ways that they write in how characters take vacations, like actual real-life vacations yes. from the show. They write that in. Um, early on, they say how... Merle, Merle, Marlin, it's so weird that they have the, like so close names. Marlin spent a summer hauling chickens or whatever with someone. Um, that was just clearly just to give him the summer off, give him time away from the show. They also say when he was younger, he caught pneumonia when I was, was out of school for a month. Again, another way to write in vacations for the real life actors that need to take them. Yeah. Yeah. There's clever solutions to coming up with like different, different aspects of, you know, like, um, <laughs> Uh, is it like I, I thought they were, um, they were. Everyone was screwed when, um, when Truman gets on the bus. I'm like, okay, so now that now they got nowhere to go, they got to, you know. And then they throw in the the bit about the the bus breaking down. You know, I thought that was clever. And then ironic that um, when they go to like with the same guys is like, I'm a bus driver, and he's trying to r- drive the boat or whatever, and like yeah. that, that breaks down too. <laughs> yeah, they're actors. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so a piece of symbolism that I loved in this movie, one of my favorite scenes, it's, um, glossed over quite quickly. They're doing the baby book photos of Truman as a kid with Merle, uh, Meryl and the mom. Um, there's a photo in there of Truman dressed as a clown in a crib, but what it really symbolizes is he is behind bars. He is in a cell, a jail, um, trapped, and he is a clown being used for the entertainment of others unknowingly. Um, I love that <laughs> symbolism in that one image that's just quickly, whoop, got to go past it. Yeah. <laughs> Why would they keep that in the, in the book? <laughs> it's like, this, this is exactly how I feel, mom. You know? <laughs> He's like, I just don't know how to explain it. He's just at therapy. This picture reminds me of my childhood. <laughs> oh my God. What if he did have a therapist yeah, in the like, show? That, more, even more subliminal messaging probably. <laughs> well, like, we were talking about like, um, there was, uh, when, when uh, Truman said at the end of the movie, he's like, you never had a, a camera on my brain. And then James said something where like, you know, like there's no, there's nothing like, you know, that he could have, you know, he could have done something. That's how they would do it with the therapist. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oof. They get a shrink and, you know, reveals that you you reveal all your deepest, darkest secrets to this person because because yeah. you confide in them. And it's like you know, there's no um, it wouldn't be malpractice because like it's, it's they're an actor, <laughs> you know. Yikes! Um, yeah, they're not bound by anything. 
Uh, so another piece of symbolism that I really liked heavily upon is the whole movie, they make references to how Sherman wanted to be an explorer as a kid. That was his dream, and it's immediately squashed. It's like, well, there's nothing left to explore. They all did it already. So good, good thing you don't need to do that. Um, so this whole movie, they're building up to the fact that he wanted to be an explorer. Um, yet the irony is he never explored his own environment, really. Like he hasn't broken routine in any day. Um, and at the end of the movie, um, I'll start with what happened after first, because it's the lesser of the two that I like. Um, the boat that he's on that he leaves Sea Haven Island in is the Santa Maria, which is the same yep. name as Christopher Columbus's ship when he was going to explore the New World. Yep. Obviously, he wasn't the first, and he's a bad man, but whatever. <laughs> um, but the symbolism that I liked more was uh, right before he has his whole break, when he pretends to be going about his day, he starts his morning off staring into the mirror. The directors, Paul Giamatti and whoever was there, are like, is this weird? And then he draws an astronaut on the mirror in this uh, soap bar. And they think he's just putting on a show, but uh, he's very clearly pushing a purposeful message when he says at the end, like, that's uh, that one's for free. Um and he himself is saying he's going to be an explorer, he, like an astronaut would be. He's exploring new worlds because the worlds he's in has already been explored. So he's taking so he, that leap up into yeah, space. Yeah, he's going to go yeah. into space. You know, yeah, that's, that's I like explore. that. I like yeah, that that's really cool. Yeah. I just want to bring attention to another piece of art that I like. I know this is a TV film uh, podcast predominantly, but a song that I really like is based off this movie, particularly the final climax of the movie with him leaving. It's called Truman by Lil Dicky, who is more known as a comedy rapper, but he can definitely put out some bangers and some serious tracks. And his whole song, it is a nine-plus-minute song to conclude his first um, album that he ever put out. Um, and the whole movie is, a, or the whole song is about how he feels like he's hitting the wall and about to like make the next step into his life and completely change from the world that he grew up in. And I just, I love that song. I recommend it for anyone that likes it. But be warned, the last like four and a half minutes is him just talking. <laughs> um, but I yeah. just wanted to shout out that song because it relates to this movie. It's based off this movie, and I like the song a lot too. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's pretty cool. I, I like that. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. One other thing that I liked. Kristoff at the end, relating more to the God um, analogy with him. When he first starts talking to Truman, Truman's like, who are you? He says, I am the creator, pause, of this TV show. Mm -hmm. And I just like that he, the way it was, I am the creator, really yeah. hitting on the head. I am God. Yeah, I'm, I must be terrible at like... <laughs> <laughs> extracting themes and stuff, which is like, <laughs> I did not catch the religious thing at all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, whatever. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, so uh, James, since you've got all this information, what's your favorite scene from your one of your top five favorite movies? Oh, Lord. I didn't prepare for this. I mean, I kind of did, but then I forgot to prepare for it. <laughs> um, I, I think I really like um, when they first discover the Truman's disappeared, you know, we have the um, scene of the director just sitting on him in the basement thinking nothing of it. And then Kristoff comes back and he's like, what is going on? He looks into it and then Marlon comes over. And then that whole scene where he's searching for Truman pops his head up out of the garden. And then they start a all out search party and they're just dropping all of their tricks to find Truman. Um, I think that's probably my favorite scene, that whole search sequence. That's that's I mean that's a good that's a good pick. I um mine's probably when um Meryl breaks. You know, where like mm -hmm. you know it's finally it's really kind of like someone I'll, coming out. I'll that, join you on that. That is also mine. Yeah. I wrote that down. Um yeah, so it starts off with, you know, honey, you should have some cocoa. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, What the fuck is that? What are you like, who are you, are you talking doing? to? What are you doing? Yeah. What are we even talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's 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 not it's really cuz you know, she gets all defensive with the knife that, you know, that, you know. Jim Carrey's going like full on schizo. She's like, "I'm not crazy. Yeah. I'm not crazy, man." Yeah, <laughs> like, and so, you know, Jim Carrey bringing out that uh, you know, high energy acting, you know. Yeah. Then he takes the knives to her throat and she's like, "Oh, that was, I was like, oh my god. Just imagine yeah. her as an actress just like, yeah, I'm going like, to die. This is not what I signed up for. <laughs> this I'm is not at all. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And then Marlon comes in to save the day. 
just you know with a, a six pack again. <laughs> yeah, he's always got a six he's pack. Got, yeah. He got the brewskis here. He's got to push his product. He's got a deal, and he's gonna live <laughs> yeah, up to he it. He made a deal, like yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's uh, it was some good scenes. This was a solid movie. Um, I think. Well, what I was just gonna add, I forgot one more trivia fact that I want to mention because we brought it up earlier off the podcast, but I think it's very worth mentioning. Um, this movie had a large budget. Um, it was considered at the time the most expensive art film ever made. It had a budget of sixty million dollars back oh, yeah. in nineteen ninety eight, mm. um, and a lot of that is went to stuff that you'd never even notice if you didn't know it was there. CGI. It's one of the first revolutionary uses of CGI within a film, especially due to the fact that if you didn't know that, you probably would never pick up on it. Um, yeah, I definitely did. Majority didn't. of the sets, like the town itself, is CGI. Most of the houses were not real. It was not um, this real island town that was um, used and or created. Uh, it was predominantly CGI, and I think it's phenomenal due to the fact that you would never know if you didn't already know. It's another great technical aspect of this movie. I mean, it that's one thing it did really well. Good camera angles. Really good CGI, really good, solid performances. Jim Carrey did a great job in this role. Ed Harris, fantastic. Makes you hate him, you know. Yeah. It just all around. It's a fantastic film. It's gonna be a. Uh, there's a few plot holes that just can't escape me. But like you know what, that's that's not important right now. But it's it's gonna sit at like about an 88 for me. True yeah. Show. So here's here's the thing. Um, I, I wasn't. I didn't go into this movie too excited, and I, I said that on last last night. Um, and, but I can recognize that it's a very well put together movie. Mm-hmm. So I'm a, I'm gonna do like a how I do on Letterbox, where like, um, so I'll give it I'll give it a rating of like a 93, but I I wouldn't say that I'd rewatch it. You know, like so I I think it's a very well put together movie, and it's like that kind of thing where like, I, I've seen it, I don't need to see it again. And uh, but ninety three is very well, very well done. All right, I will say I'll disagree with you there a little bit. I think this movie is better on a second watch through, just because you can pick up on a lot of the subtle, more smaller hints and instances. I mean, going into it already knowing what to expect certainly helps. But like, if you have never seen the movie before, only have a vague idea, I think a second viewing is absolutely necessary. With that said. I like we mentioned at the beginning, this has always been and will always be considered one of my favorite movies of all time. I gotta go high here. I'm saying 99. 99. 99. 99. Okay. It's yeah. my favorite movie of all time, has been since pretty much I first saw it. Does that make this a uh, a five star movie? I don't really know. Because you gave it an 88, I gave it 93, he gave it 99. Yeah. That's probably a five star movie star right movie. there. All right, cool. Yeah. So we have we have a fifth movie to our uh, fourth, kno- fourth or fifth? Who, who knows where we are? Well, yeah, I haven't kept track on on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, we should see before. We probably okay. should go back to that, but <laughs> okay. you know, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we are seen it before. You can find us on Instagram and TikTok with the handle at Seen It Beforecast. That's S C E N E It Beforecast, and on Twitter with the handle at Sib underscore Pod S I B underscore Pod. I'm Dan. I'm Danny. You can find me on Instagram at Danny underscore Wass, my letterbox at DJ Wass, and my YouTube channel, which is just Danny Wass. Um, James, would you like to plug anything? Yeah. Hi, I'm James. Thank you for having me on the podcast. You can find me on Letterboxd at James81XA. All right, cool. Yeah, so good podcast, everybody. Yeah, you're, that was a terrible That's a terrible. That's why you do the outro. That's why I do the outro. <laughs> so like, it's been an honor, as usual, everyone. Follow us, like, and subscribe, all that stuff. James will be back for another franchise we do eventually in yep. the uh, so next did. month and a half, two months or so. But yep. uh, we'll, we'll give you more of a heads up when we get to it. But, yeah, we'll catch you next time. <laughs>